Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Integrated Community Energy and Climate Action Plans, or ICECAP Partnership, and the Georgian Bay Biosphere, welcome to the Understanding and Calculating Your Greenhouse Gas Emissions webinar. My name is Benjamin John. I am the Climate Change and Energy Specialist for the Georgian Bay Biosphere. And once again, I just want to thank you very much for joining us here today. And we're going to jump right in. At this point, I imagine most of us have participated in a Zoom meeting or webinar before, um, but just in case, I want to start out by pointing some of the features that are available to you. So there is a question and answer tool, a Q&A tool. Um, if you have a question at any time during the webinar, I ask that you just please put it in that tool. This can should be able to be found beside the microphone or the video camera button. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of each presentation. So again, I ask that you just put your questions in that uh, tool there. Also note that we will be recording today's session and uploading it to our YouTube channel. Um, and a link will be made available to the video and other resources mentioned in today's presentation uh, following uh, the webinar. So it'll be circulated to you all. So as we wait for a few more people to join, um, I'd like to share a little bit about the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. We're one of 18 UNESCO World Biospheres in Canada, and our region is ecologically unique with the world's largest freshwater archipelago on Earth. Um, our biosphere, it stretches 200 kilometers uh, from the Severn River in the south to the French River in the north along eastern Georgian Bay and was designated back in 2004. We are a registered charity with an office in Perry Sound, and we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to do our conservation and education work. And we'd like to acknowledge the land that uh, we are on before we begin. The Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of Huron-Robinson Treaty of 1850, and the Williams Treaty of 1920, and is located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of indigenous peoples in this territory and work towards respectful and reciprocal relationships as we are all caretakers of the land. Um, before we begin, I just wanna say thanks again for joining. I'm very excited to get started. Um, I have a lot of, to discuss, so in the interest of time, I think it's best we get going. Um, and once again, I will just remind everyone that if you have a question, to please use that question and answer tool. So I've organized this webinar into six sections that will continue to build off the previous one. Uh, to begin, I want to discuss um, about what greenhouse gases are and where they come from to give some context into how they drive the, are driving the climate crisis. We'll then go into a brief overview that demonstrates the complexity of calculating greenhouse gases. And I'll introduce you to the carbon calculator tool that makes this calculation of greenhouse gases very easy to do so. And while I go over the carbon calculator, I'll tell you all the information that you need to gather ahead of time in order to complete it. I'll then conclude by going over what your results mean and how they compare, um, just to give some context to, to your results as well. So let's begin by asking, what is a greenhouse gas? Well, the technical definition is that it is a gas that absorbs and emits radiant energy within the thermal infrared range. Now, this is a very scientific and complex definition. So what does this mean in simpler terms? Well. Simply put, a greenhouse gas is just a gas in Earth's atmosphere that's letting sunlight pass through the atmosphere, but it's preventing the heat that the sunlight brings from leaving the atmosphere. It's also important to know that when we're using the term greenhouse gases, we're actually referring to a number of different gases. Um, the one that we hear the most frequently is going to be carbon dioxide. And there's a reason for this, and, and we'll see why this is shortly. 
But there's also other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as well. Some of these include methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, uh, we have chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs and CFCs, which represent uh, groups of dozens of different um, similar gases. And we also have water vapor. Um, water vapor is actually an incredibly important greenhouse gas and is known to be the most abundant in the atmosphere. In terms of how it contributes to climate change, it has a very interesting relationship with carbon dioxide, but that's getting into some of the more very technical details and chemistry details. So if you're curious about this uh, relationship between carbon dioxide and water vapor, I'd encourage you to reach out following the webinar and we can have a discussion about that. Um, so we have all these greenhouse gases that are existing in the atmosphere. Now, in order to categorize them and provide some structure to how we think about them, scientists have classified them into natural and synthetic greenhouse gases. The natural ones are things like carbon dioxide and methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor, ozone. Um, and these are greenhouse gases that would still exist in the atmosphere in the absence of humans as they're integral components or parts of naturally occurring systems on Earth. On the other hand, there are also synthetic greenhouse gases like those chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs or hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs. We have parafluorocarbons or PFCs, sulfur hexafluoride and, and many, many other complicated chemistry names. Um, and as you can see by this chart on the right of, of HFCs here, that there's numerous greenhouse gases that are considered to be synthetic. These synthetic greenhouse gases, they're ma essentially man-made chemicals commonly used as in refrigerants, in fire extinguishing, foam production, and things such as aerosols. And in comparison to those naturally occurring greenhouse gases, these ones do not exist naturally in nature. They cannot be found on their own. Again, the key to this is that they're man-made. Um, so in the absence of humans, these synthetic greenhouse gases would not exist. So now that we know what greenhouse gases are, uh, we can begin to ask where they come from. Well, there's also two categories in which where we consider that these greenhouse gases or are, are originating from. And the first is to look at those naturally occurring greenhouse gases. We just mentioned that we can classify some of them as being natural and that they would exist in nature, even if humans aren't around. And this is essentially what natural greenhouse gases are. Um, these natural processes are incredibly important because they are some of the building blocks that have allowed life to also exist on Earth. So when we're looking at these cycles, they have these sources and sinks within them. Essentially, a, a greenhouse gas source would put that gas into the atmosphere and the sink would sequester or absorb them. So for example, if we look at the carbon dioxide, sorry, the carbon cycle that we have here on the screen, it can be naturally produced through this system. It's put there naturally into the atmosphere and then later absorbed again to create this recurring cycle being absorbed by things like the ocean or um, organic matter such as plants and trees. And then we can also look at the methane cycle. Methane is also naturally produced through one of Earth's natural systems. And then we can continue on and look at other naturally occurring greenhouse gases, such as nitrous oxide, which is going to be a component of the nitrogen cycle. But in the context of climate change, what we're really concerned about are the origins or what we call anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Simply put, these anthropogenic Greenhouse gases are both natural and synthetic greenhouse gases that are being produced by human activity. And as we can examine these anthropogenic emissions by looking at human activities from say broad sectors in which they're coming from. So the pie chart here on the screen shows a breakdown of 
where Canada's anthropogenic greenhouse gases are coming from. So you can see we have categories such as transportation, we have these fugitive energy sources, we have industrial processes and product use, agriculture, waste, stationary combustion sources, which includes some uh, basically our build the energy we're using in our buildings and our homes. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus in on three categories in particular. The transportation sector, um, the stationary sources, which again, a portion of which includes the energy we use in our buildings and our homes, um, and waste. So basically the things that we're throwing away and sending to a landfill. And it's these anthropogenic greenhouse gases that again are driving climate change. Essentially, human activity is causing an imbalance to these natural systems that we just saw by producing greenhouse gases faster than they can be sequestered or absorbed naturally. So essentially what happens is that they just begin to accumulate in the atmosphere because there's nothing to absorb or draw them back in. So what you see here, these, these graphs, they show the concentrations or levels of individual greenhouse gases over the last 800,000 years in the atmosphere. So we have carbon dioxide on the left here, we have methane in the middle, and we have nitrous oxide on the right. Again, coming from those three natural processes that we saw being the carbon cycle, the methane cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. And again, I, I apologize that it might be a little hard to see, but you'll notice that in each one of these graphs that there's a massive spike um, at the end of each one of them occurring in the methane, or sorry, the carbon dioxide cycle in here. We have the methane uh, spike here and the nitrous oxide spike up in here. And these spikes are showing a massive increase in the concentrations of all three of these gas gases in the atmosphere. And the other thing you'll notice too is that they've shot up in very recent history too, correlating with things such as the industrial revolution and proceeding in today's um, current human activity with our globalized supply chains and, and just how we go about our, our daily modern lives, um, further showing that, you know, our human activity is putting excessive quantities of all different types of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it's through these gases accumulating in the atmosphere, again, that's, that's driving climate change. So when greenhouse gases are emitted, again, they begin to accumulate in the atmosphere. And as we saw from that definition at the very beginning, um, they're absorbing more heat as more sunlight is, is being absorbed as well. So this trapped heat, it sort of acts as like a blanket, um, causing the earth to warm through a process called the greenhouse effect. So as global temperatures rise, more polar ice melts, uh, it shrinks the white reflective area and expanding the dark surface areas such as oceans, lakes, and land that absorbs the sun's rays. And basically this chain of events speeds up the rate at which the world warms rather than progressing it at a slow and steady pace or even maintaining it at, at, a, at a current pace. So with greenhouse gases being such a major driver of climate change, it's therefore important that we measure them. Um, by measuring them, we can assess our current state or a baseline which can be compared to in the future. By measuring greenhouse gases, we can also see where our efforts should be directed. Uh, for example, you may recall from the pie chart of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions by those different sectors, that the transportation sector was accounting for 30% of emissions and the waste sector accounted for roughly 2.5%. So by having this type of information, we can then begin to consider things such as how we allocate resources into reducing emissions. So 
Maybe, for example, we want to allocate more resources to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector uh, because it represents a, a larger proportion of those emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. Moving on, we can also evaluate our efforts or actions to ensure that they are, in fact, reducing emissions. Um, but just as importantly, if they aren't reducing emissions, then that knowledge allows us to adjust our efforts and actions accordingly to ensure that they are, in fact, reducing emissions. So there is incredible value to measuring greenhouse gas emissions, um, and it should really be one of the first steps in taking climate action because of these benefits. And, and I like to say, because really, how do you know if you've actually reduced your, your emissions if you don't know how much you're producing in the first place? You need to have a number to be able to measure it against and work off or towards. So the process, how do we go about calculating our greenhouse gas emissions then? Well, the high level formula to do so is basically it's our energy consumption times an emission factor times what's called a global warming potential. And we can break this down a bit to see what each of these components and, and variables means. So to begin, if we're thinking about greenhouse gas emissions as the ultimate outcome of that we're, that we're measuring, and we have to remember, we just have a whole bunch of different greenhouse gases that we've just seen. Again, we have carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, CSCs, HSCs, so on and so forth. Um, because of this, we need to have one common metric that allows us to compare emissions on a one-to-one -one basis, which the common unit is referred to as carbon dioxide equivalents, or CO2e. Now, an emission factor is just a value that attempts to relate the quantity of a greenhouse gas emission released, sorry, the it attempts to relate the quantity of the emission being released um, with the activity associated with that, which is, again, it's very a complicated way of just saying that your car is producing, say, X amounts of carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide for every liter of gasoline that it's using. And finally, we have what's called a global warming potential which is a measure of a greenhouse gas's ability to trap heat in the atmosphere in comparison to carbon dioxide over a period of time. So essentially it's ability to trap heat through um, that greenhouse effect. And this is incredibly important that we have this metric because, or sorry, this variable, this global warming potential because all greenhouse gases are different. They have, they stay in the atmosphere for different periods of times. And again, they have are able to trap different amounts of heat. Building off the point that we're measuring greenhouse gases in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents or that CO2e, one of the reasons why carbon dioxide has been chosen as this base gas is because it is, it is the greenhouse gas that is produced the most through human activity. So, on the screen is a breakdown of Canada's emissions in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents for carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and a whole grouping of, of those synthetic greenhouse gases as well. And what you'll notice is that um, carbon dioxide is accounting for 80% of those anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And the other reason why we need to use a single metric to measure um, greenhouse gases uh, in, in carbon dioxide equivalents is because, again, they all have different characteristics and warming potentials. So again, by bringing them into this common unit, it's going to allow us to have equal comparisons on a one-to-one -one basis. And you'll see here by this chart on the left that um, some of these global warming potential values um, are much greater than what carbon dioxide's poten warming potential is. So, for example, 25 uh, methane has a global warming potential 25 times greater than carbon dioxide. Uh, 
Um, something like sulfur hexafluoride, which is a synthetic greenhouse gas, has a global warming potential that's 22,800 times stronger than carbon dioxide. So bringing this all into terms of carbon dioxide, again, we can compare them on a one-to-one -one basis. So now that we can see and, and consider the values that are going into that really high level formula, um, we can see that this process is beginning to get much, much more complicated. So what we have up here is essentially just a formula that you would use to calculate, say, the greenhouse gas emissions from a single energy source in your home, like propane um, that you're using to heat your home. So you'll see that you know this, this formula is considering the carbon dioxide emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions, as well as the methane emissions, and putting it all back into, again, that carbon dioxide equivalents. But if we're trying to think of our home as a whole, um, we have to remember that you know, homes are using more than one energy source. Um, so we need to consider this formula multiple times. For example, we may be, uh, so we would have electricity in our homes or propane or fuel oil. And we need to consider, you know, the carbon dioxide emissions, the nitrous oxide emissions and the methane emissions that are coming from each one of these electricity sources, propane sources. And now the whole process just becomes even more complicated and to boot, we can get into situations where we may not know how much energy we're using. So we have to have additional formulas to find that out. So what we've done is create a carbon calculator to make this process of calculating your greenhouse gas emissions a lot easier and quicker to do. This tool, it allows uh, permanent residents, seasonal residents and businesses in Ontario to calculate their greenhouse gas emissions produced by their buildings, transportation and waste. And you may recall from that pie chart we discussed earlier that these were those three categories that we wanted to focus on. Um, additionally, this tool also assists with climate change and energy planning for the ICECAP partnership and other communities in the Eastern Georgian Bay and Muskoka region by helping to build that initial baseline of emissions in the community. So yeah, essentially helping to calculate community-wide emissions. One of the features of the carbon calculator that we are quite proud of is, is how it easy it is to actually use. And because of this user-friendly format, once you've collected the information that you'll need, and I'm about to go over that those information pieces, it really doesn't take more than 10, 15 minutes to fill it out. So beginning with buildings, uh, the carbon calculator needs to know the amounts and types of energy you're using to operate the lights, the heating, and other utilities in your home or business. In particular, it will ask for your electricity consumption in kilowatt hours, it's going to ask for your cubic meters of natural gas, liters of propane or fuel oil, uh, cords of wood or kilograms of wood pellets that you use, and as well as you want to have this, each of these energy sources over an average year. You can get this information oftentimes from your energy bills, or you can estimate it by referring to the additional information bubbles beside each question. And these are just a few snippets of some of the questions in this building section. These additional information bubbles you'll see here are just the, the, uh, the little eyes in the gray circles. Typically on your energy bills, if you're using um, those to collect the information, which I'll mention is the recommended uh, route of going because you will get a much more accurate uh, results of the emissions that you are producing. Um, you can typically find this information in, uh, in boxes like the one that I have on here on this on the screen. Um, this is just a snippet that comes from a typical hydro bill where it will say your usage in kilowatt hours. And this is these are the types of um, information that we're looking, for example, um, to be filled in these questions. Now, I should also mention that you'll also be asked questions about whether the building is, is a permanent or a seasonal residence, how many people typically occupy it, and 
whether or not renewable energy is being used. And these questions really just allow us to organize the information better and to produce an average amount of greenhouse gases being produced per person in that residence. The next category is transportation, which is broken down into three subcategories. We have on-road vehicles, marine transportation or watercraft, and off-road vehicles. And this is actually one of the aspects that uh, makes this carbon calculator unique is that it is considering watercraft. Um, so beginning with on-road vehicles, the carbon calculator is going to ask for the types and number of vehicles that you, your family and business owns. Are they cars, vans, motorcycles? Are they electric vehicles or hybrids? Are they trucks or plug-in hybrids? You'll also need to know the make, model and year as well as very importantly, the kilometers traveled in a single year for each vehicle owned on average. Most vehicles will have their make and model labeled on the front or back side of the vehicle and the kilometers traveled per year uh, can be estimated by dividing the odometer reading, how many total kilometers are on the vehicle by the age of that vehicle. So if you're still not sure of, of the kilometers that you travel per year on average, you can also estimate this by referring to the additional information bubble as well. And then you can just assess, you know, do you think you drive more or less than the average Ontarian? Marine transportation will calculate the emissions produced by your boats and other motorized watercraft, such as sea doos and jet skis. For this, you'll need to know how much horsepower the engine has and whether it's consuming gasoline or diesel and approximately how many hours per year you're operating it. For your operating hours, it's extremely crucial that you're only considering the hours that your engine is actually in use. Um, you don't want to include time where the watercraft is being either propelled by, say, an electric trolling motor, or it's not moving at all. And off-road vehicles, they look at the emissions being produced by dirt bikes, ATVs, snowmobiles, and other similar recreational vehicles. Uh, you'll need to know similar information here that you do for boats. Um, in particular, you'll need to know the engine's cubic centimeters, which is often referred to as CCs, whether it's using gasoline or diesel, and approximately how many year, or sorry, how many hours per year you're operating it. Information on the engine's CCs or cubic centimeters, this can often be found following the vehicle's year and brand name. For example, you may hear people refer to, as a, to a snowmobile as a 2018 Snowmobile X1000. Um, and in this case, the cc's or those cubic centimeters of this snowmobile are going to be a thousand. Um, and again, it's also crucial that for the operating hours, you're considering that the time that the vehicle is actually in use. The final category is solid waste. And there are two main questions to this section. Um, the first asks how many large size garbage bags that you, your household or business is producing in, in a monthly period um, on average. So for reference, a large size garbage bag can roughly hold two and a half to three kitchen garbage bags. Um, a good way to think of the size of a large garbage bag is it's really just the black ones that you put out on the for the roadside collection that have all the smaller garbage bags inside. Um, the other question asks about the types of waste you put in the garbage, be it food, plastic, cardboard, wood products. And here it's really important not to include any recycling or composting that you do in this question. Um, we're only considering what's going into the garbage cans. Um, and the reason for this is because um, your recycling, for example, is not going to a landfill where it's going to be producing emissions. Um, in, in, in principle, that recycling will be 100% reused and repurposed before it goes to a landfill at a later date. Now, I should also mention that after waste, the carbon calculator has a section for climate change and energy planning in your community. 
And in this section, you're encouraged to share your ideas for how your community can adapt to climate change or reduce its emissions. Um, so what projects or programs would you like to see in your, pro, uh, in your community to, to achieve this? And you'll also be asked by what percentage you feel your community should reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and by 2050, just to start setting some of those um, emission reduction targets. Once you've completed all the questions and receive your results, you'll notice that your results are compared to what are called Ontario and Canada's direct end use emissions per capita, which is 3.7 and 3.9 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E. That's again, that's all the greenhouse gas emissions combined uh, respectively. Based on those results and the comparisons that are made, um, there are two frequently asked questions that I receive from this. The first question is usually along the lines of, well, I thought the greenhouse gas emissions per capita in, in Canada were closer to 20 tons per, per person, not 3.9. And the second question is often expressed with maybe some confusion, uh, shame, or other similar emotion as to why that individual's results were so much higher than the average, even when they are already being conscious of their actions and decisions and the, em the emissions that they're producing. So I wanna take a few minutes here to provide some context behind these results um, and how they compare. So let's start with the question asking about the amount of emissions produced per person. Is it 3.9 or is it closer to 20? Which, which one is it? And the answer is actually that both are correct. It just depends on the perspective or the lens that you're looking at this situation through. Through the one lens, we have, again, these direct end use emissions um, per capita, which is going to be those greenhouse gases that you've produced through final consumption of energy or waste. Um, so to give an example of this, this is basically like the gasoline that's in your car or the propane that you've used in your furnace or the fuel oil that you've used in your furnace or natural gas for heating. The other lens is total emissions, which considers all human activity and all economic activity that's happening within the region of question. So in this case, what we have up here on the screen is Ontario and Canada. So to illustrate this, let's take a, a typical take make waste supply chain um, that we have here on the screen. We start with the raw material extraction on the left hand side, then maybe it goes to a refinery or processing facility uh, before going to a manufacturer as an output, uh, sorry, as an input for some product. Then it's sent to a store maybe where we later purchase it, bring it home, use it, and eventually throw it away when we're done with it. Now the total emissions per capita is considering all the economic, economic activities that are happening within this supply chain. Everything from the extraction of the raw material to when it's thrown away and everything that's happening in between. On the other hand, the direct end use emissions, which we can also is also referred to as household emissions, look at those greenhouse gases being produced through the direct consumption of energy or the production of waste. Again, that's you know, the gasoline in your car or the natural gas that you're using to heat your home. And one of the reasons why this perspective, this end use emissions per capita perspective exists is because it places responsibility for greenhouse gas emission production on each individual as well as businesses. And it asks them to make more responsible energy and production choices. So when we start to look at the supply chain as a whole, we can begin to see this as a call to action from all parties, because again, uh, at certain stages of the supply chain, each player is going to have direct control over the energy and inputs that they're using. So for example, you know, an industrial facility will have the direct control over the processes and the amount of energy that, that they're using and subsequently the greenhouse gas emissions that are produced. This lens implicitly says that 
tackling climate change is going to be achieved through a cooperation and a collective effort of industry, businesses, and individual consumers and families alike. Okay, so let's now get into the second question, asking why some results are higher in comparison to the average, even when that individual is, say, conscious of their actions and their decisions and the emissions that they're producing. And the answer to this lies in what's called urban rural disparities. So to illustrate this, uh, we're just going to do a, a quick and simple math exercise. So to begin in Ontario, 86.2% um, of rev residents live in urban areas, uh, while the remaining 13.8% live in rural areas. So for the purposes of our little math exercise, like we're going to round this and say that 86% of people are urban and 14% of which are rural. So for the 86 urban people, we can hypothetically say that each one produces three tons of emissions. And for the 14 rural individuals, we'll say that each one produces six tons. So in total, the, the urban population is producing a total of 258 tons, while the rural population is producing 84 tons. Now to make an average per person for the total population, we then need to add these up. So the 258 and the 84, and then divide it by the total number of people, which in this case is going to be 100. And in the end, per person, we get a hypothetical 3.4 tons of greenhouse gas emissions or CO2e per capita. So you might be asking then, well, why did the rural individuals, were they given a higher amount of emissions at the start? And that's because of those urban rural disparities that I mentioned. In comparison, um, urban populations typically have greater access to things like public transportation, shorter travel distances to public services and amenities, um, established recycling and composting programs, access to cleaner fuel sources for heating their homes, such as natural gas in comparison to propane or fuel oil. Um, and because of these factors and others too, urban populations are therefore able to achieve lower emissions per capita more easily. And that's not to say that every urban resident is going to have uh, lower emissions per capita, uh, or lower emissions as individuals. Um, again, in part, that that's why this is an average, because individuals have different lifestyles. Um, uh, but what happens is that because the urban population greatly outnumbers the rural population in, in Ontario, simply because of how averages are created in this mathematical process, it ends up becoming this average more reflective of urban lifestyles rather than rural. And this is actually one of the things that the carbon calculator is hoping to achieve. Um, to be able to calculate emissions per capita for rural residents in our region in particular, because at present, uh, this type of information does not exist. And these urban rural disparities, they shouldn't be taken in a discouraging way either. Um, I should quickly mention that. Rather, they should be viewed as an opportunity to be innovative and creative and explore so many different opportunities that exist to reduce emissions while potentially creating new jobs and services um, for our rural communities. So to conclude, there are a few things that I'm hoping that you can take away from this webinar. The first is that there are many greenhouse gases that exist and it's human activity that's producing excessive quantities of both natural and synthetic greenhouse gases that are driving climate change. The second is that greenhouse gases are measured in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents or CO2e because we're trying to measure multiple greenhouse gases at the same time and be able to compare them. And it's important to understand them so when we focus our reduction efforts and ensure our uh, sorry, it's important that we understand them so we can focus our reduction efforts and ensure that our efforts are in fact uh, working towards reducing emissions. And finally, that the carbon calculator can help you to calculate your greenhouse gas emissions easily and quickly and compare future performance. And I highly encourage you all to complete the carbon calculator as it is, as I mentioned, it's an important first step uh, 
into taking climate action. Uh, the link for completing it is gbbr.ca slash carbon dash calculator. And I'll put that link up on the screen shortly. Um, before we get into questions, I do want to mention that we have a contest on the way at the moment. Uh, so by completing the carbon calculator, you may be eligible to win a gift certificate to a local restaurant in the Georgian Bay Biosphere region. And I also want to mention that word of mouth is an incredibly powerful tool as well. Um, if each one of you leaves today and tells one person either about the carbon calculator or about something that you've learned, and then they tell one person, and then they tell one person, and so on and so forth, the message will be able to reach a lot of people in the end. But with that being said, I just want to thank you all for participating. I'll now pull up the question and answer tool if you have any questions. Um, and if you'd like to reach out to me at any point, um, I can be reached at climate at gbbr.ca. Thank you. I'll give everybody a few minutes to put some questions into the Q&A tool. Okay, our first question is, can you go over what an emission factor is in the equation? Um, yes, really what an emission factor is, um, an emission factor is basically the amount of greenhouse gases that are going to be produced through a certain activity. Again, that's the complicated way of saying it. If we were to think again of our vehicle, um, if we're thinking of our vehicle, when we're using, uh, say, the gasoline that's within it, there's certain quantities of, of emissions that are going to be produced as a result of burning that gasoline. So let's say we're looking at a liter of, of gasoline within that vehicle. Um, when you burn that liter of gasoline, you're then putting, say, X number of grams of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You're then putting X number of methane into the atmosphere and X amounts of, of, um, of nitrous oxide. And these emission factors have been tested and produced by scientists all over the world. So basically what it says is that there are these preset values that says when you burn a liter of gasoline in your vehicle, given you know fuel efficiency and all these other parameters, this is the set amount of greenhouse gases for, again, carbon dioxide that's going to be produced, methane and nitrous oxide. And that's essentially what that emission factor is. The next question is, why, did, why was food not included um, as a category? The reason why food was not included as a category into the carbon calculator is that because food as a whole considers the entire extent of that supply chain. And in the end, we're looking at just the end use emissions. Um, so if we're thinking about food and the carbon footprint that comes with food, we have to think about the industrial inputs, you know, that went into the agricultural processes and all the transportation in between, and then the waste because the food gets thrown out in the end. So if we're thinking about that, we have we already have a category set out for transportation, um, which again we can look at that as 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 part of that sort of category. But when we're looking at community as a whole, you know the production side of that food um, that's going to be captured underneath sort of that industrial sector, um, which again those those uh, businesses and and 
industry are able to use the carbon calculator to find out their emissions as well. Um, as well too, the transportation that comes in between, that's, that's going to be considered too as well as depending on who's using it and filling it out. Um, so, and then when it goes to the landfill in the end, the food does, that's captured in that waste category. So really what, again, what I'm, that was a, a long way of saying that the carbon calculator is looking just at how energy is using, is being used rather than the purposes I think should be um, used. Is it being, is energy being used in the industrial sector, the commercial sector, or the residential sector, transportation or waste? So in the end, all the emissions that those, that food, that food supply chain would have produced would still end up being captured um, and reported on um, just in a different manner. Leave another couple minutes for potentially some additional questions. So the next question is, is an email required for the carbon calculator and does it collect personal information? Um, an email, I will say, is not required to complete the carbon calculator. We do not need your email to do so. Um, the only time that your email would be needed is if you wish to be included in the contest that we are holding. The carbon calculator, it doesn't necessarily, it collects a little bit of personal information, but very high level information. So the extent, for example, of information that we're looking at, of personal information that we're looking at is, say, what municipality or first nation is your home residing in? We don't need to have an address. Um, we simply need to know uh, where, where that residence is residing so we can allocate those emissions and energy use to a certain geographic region, and then it can be um, joined in with a whole bunch of um, other entries from that region as well. Um, the next question is, do you have a short explainer for filling out the calculator or plan to do one? Um, yes, we do have a short explainer for filling out the carbon calculator and that resource will be made available um, in the follow-up email that's sent out with a link to the calculator as well. I'll leave a couple more minutes again for some additional questions if there's any. Okay, well, I think that's looking like all the questions that we have today. So before we go, I just wanna say thank you everybody for joining us uh, once again for this webinar. If you do end up having a question, um, you are more than welcome to reach out to myself. Again, that's climate at gbbr.ca. Uh, thanks again for everybody for joining the webinar. I hope you enjoy your day.